Friede. The website called Anglican Compass is a good resource for learning about the liturgical ethos of Anglicanism. I look at this site and I read other resources as well to better educate myself about the historical liturgies and traditions of the faith. And for many years now, I have also followed the writings of a retired Lutheran English professor whom I find quite thought-provoking. Many of my thoughts tonight are gleaned from both the Anglican Compass and from this Lutheran writer. Today, as you know, is Ash Wednesday. It is a day for repentance and sober reflection launching us into the season of Lent. Lent is a season in which we prepare for the celebration of Easter by walking through a holy Lent. And this has been the practice of the church uh, since ancient times. And it is patterned after Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Lent, as we said, is a season of repentance, fasting, and self-reflection. And of course, all this happens or should be happening with the sure knowledge as Christians of God's love and grace towards us through Jesus Christ. Lent and Ash Wednesday are in no way about condemnation. There is no flagellation here uh, in our tradition. <laughs> Rather, they are a time in which human beings, given a pronouncement of forgiveness and absolution through Christ, can now be honest with God honest with one another and honest with oneself because with the terror of judgment removed in Christ we can speak the truth as you will see in just a few moments ashes are used in this service as a liturgical aid ashes on the head have signified repentance throughout biblical times. You remember the story of Job who once said, I repent in dust and ashes. Ashes also represent mourning in the Old Testament. As per the writers from the Anglican Compass, we can reflect Ashes, they say, are the result of burning. This burning in our lives is from our own sins and follies and from the abuse of others. And ashes represent both. They remind us that we are living in this mortal world, this fallen world, and that we are made from dust. And when all else is burned away, we are mortal and will return to our maker. Do you remember singing the children's song, ring around, I'm not going to sing it, ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. It's stuck in your brain, isn't it? And we would sing that song while running in circles faster and faster and faster until we all fall down. Now, there are numerous tales of folklore as to the origin of the song. One is that it dates back to the days of the Black Plague during the Middle Ages and that the rosy was a sore on the body and the posy was a flower that was believed to help protect you from the disease. 
Another symptom of the plague was sneezing. And so ashes, ashes sounded like a chew, a chew. <laughs> and then we all fall down, dead. That's where some say that song came from. Another folklore was that the rose, rosy refers to the rosary. So that the song becomes a Catholic jingle about the devotional practice of praying using a circle of beads uh, to keep track of the prayer cycle. I like what Gene Veith, this retired Lutheran writer, has to say about this song. I do not believe that the song and the game has anything to do with Ash Wednesday, but it does conjure up a picture in my mind about this holiday. We are running around in circles, not getting much of anywhere, but going faster and faster. That is, we are busier and busier as we pursue the ever-repeating cycles of our jobs and vocations, the weeks, the months, the years, the cycles of history. All of that seems futile to some people, or more positively, it is a game that we play. Then, ashes, ashes. The message of Ash Wednesday summons us out of our trivial preoccupations. You are dust, we're told, and to dust you shall return. We all fall down. All the cycles end for us when we die. And death should give us a perspective on our running around in circles, waking us up from our complacency our pockets full of poses. This is the message of God's law and the wages of sin. Now for us, the, the cycle of the church turns from the joy of Christmas and the light of epiphany as we've just seen to now the darker season of Lent, a time when we think about the state of our souls and our need for salvation. Then comes Easter. After we all fall down, Jesus takes us by the hand and raises us back up with him. Thanks be to God. It's a nice song after all. So what are some of the ways then you can observe a Christian Lent? First, as our gospel text made it clear, we should realize that except for wearing ashes on Ash Wednesday, your acts of discipline during Lent, whatever they are, are private between you and God. We don't parade what we do or don't do. Second, we, might, we remind ourselves that what we do is not for gaining a feather in our cap. We can't increase our standing with God, for we are complete in Christ. But what we do, but we do what we do, I should say, as a humble example of following after Christ in his faith and in his obedience. Yet contrary to him, our actions are acts of penitence, which, simply speaking, are demonstrations of a heartfelt repentance. Now, maybe you'll find that you can't fast <clears throat> because of your health requirements. But we can all give up something or change some routine that helps us to more diligently focus on our walk with Christ. And that's often the intent of this season. Perhaps it has to do with diet for many of us. Perhaps it has to do with exercise. Perhaps it has to do with more prayers or longer prayer time. Perhaps it has to do with more scripture reading more doctrinal or theological studies and reflection upon the 
the Christian message on how to, whatever those are, more diligently and more faithfully delight in Christ. And isn't that what we want? Not only for this season, but as an ordered way of living every day. It is a sober season. It is not a sorrowful season. For we have abundant life in Jesus Christ. And however you practice your personal Lent, it is my prayer that it may be one in which God's grace so overwhelms and comforts you that you are able to freely acknowledge your failings and your faults. And yet, with the sure knowledge that you are his child and that he loves you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.